Hi everyone, my name is Ralph Gomers. I'm a NumPy and SciPy maintainer, and I lead Quantsight Labs, which is an open source lab focused on the PyData ecosystem. I'm very glad to be here. It's my first MX Lab workshop, and I'm going to be talking to you about API standardization for array libraries in Python. So API standardization is not something we've done before in the Python ecosystem. And to understand why we need it now, we need to briefly go back in history. So we start about 25 years ago um, with Numeric, which was the first Python array library. Um, that was all by itself for about eight years, and then someone developed NumArray. Then we had two, which was immediately a problem. Uh, so very quickly after, um, Travis Oliphant decided to start writing NumPy. And in 2005, 2006, uh, that brought, you know, took the best ideas of numeric and numarray and brought back everything together into a single array library. Um, then for about 10 years, uh, there was mostly peace and quiet. Um, until around 2015, when we first got Dask, uh, TensorFlow, uh, and then many of the other libraries. Uh, and today, the situation is that we have about seven uh, libraries or frameworks um, and more experimental ones. And this is what it looks like. So the key problem there is fragmentation. Um, people are writing packages for only a single array library. And it's sometimes possible to make something work with multiple libraries. Uh, for example, people can combine NumPy and then Dask. Um, but if you look at many of these packages, like SciPy and Scikit-Learn just work with NumPy, FastAI just works with PyTorch, uh, Keras just works with TensorFlow, and so on. Everyone builds in their own silo. Um, so clearly that's a problem. Um, there's very little reuse of code. And we can't really just do what NumPy did 15 years ago, uh, write one new library to kind of bring them all back together. Like, there's too much innovation and everything moves too fast. Um, so the tentative solution that has been emerging recently is most frameworks are introducing a more NumPy-like API. Like MXNet 2.0 is rewriting something to be NumPy compatible TensorFlow just introduced tensorflow.experimental.numpy. Um, Jax has a NumPy namespace, and PyTorch is also uh, adding more NumPy compatibility. However, there's some issues with that. Um, some of the choices that NumPy made in the past uh, may be suboptimal, and it has behavior that doesn't quite fit newer libraries. Um, so some of those differences may actually be necessary, uh, and others are just artifacts of history. Um, so what we do see is that all of these libraries have mostly common con concepts uh, like indexing, uh, typecasting, etc. And they also have functionality that's at its core very similar. Um, so, but there are many, many small and some larger incompatibilities. And it's very painful to translate code from one array library to another. Uh, so let's have a look at some examples. Okay, so what I've done here is define some very simple functions uh, to test, uh, to be able to run with every array library, uh, which you passed in here as mod, um, and then um, do some array processing and return the first element of each array. Um, so we're only using very simple functions like ones and uh, built-in operators. Um, so there's a number of these functions uh, also to test behavior with in-place operators, um, with slicing, um, doing a reshape here, and um, slice assignment, it's starting to get a little trickier. Um, another function using uh, diagonal, um, and then some testing with indexing. So I'm calling these functions here which are defined higher up uh, so that they work with all array libraries. 
So the get first element uh, gives you a first glimpse of what's wrong. Um, first task uh, is lazy, so you have to add a dot compute. Then uh, mxnet, when you try to extract the scalar, doesn't actually give it to you, so you have to add an scalar method. Um, the ones function uh, to create a 3 by 2 shaped array of uh, in 32s. Um, you want to give the in32 D type, but MXNet doesn't actually have D types, so you have to use NumPy D types. Um, for the reshape, you'll find that uh, TensorFlow doesn't have methods on its tensor object, uh, so you have to use the function rather than the method. Um, for arrays, you will find that TensorFlow chose another name. MXNet returns floats from A range rather than integers. Um, for diagonal, you'll find that. TensorFlow again has another name. Uh, NumPy, actually you have to make a copy because it returns a view rather than a copy by default. And for slice assignment, it gets even more complicated. Uh, so you have to find really other expressions to make this work. In May of this year, we started the Consortium for Python Data API Standards to try and solve this problem in a structured way. Uh, we started developing tooling to easily compare APIs uh, to do runtime analysis to collect good telemetry data on what functionality gets used and how. Uh, that tooling is pretty powerful. Uh, it allows finding which keywords are used, uh, what types they have, and reconstructing a complete type annotated API from that. Uh, and that's a, a really good starting point to start having discussions uh, on what should end up in the standard. Um, so about a month ago, uh, we published the Array API standard as an RFC, uh, which means it's now open for wider review, and uh, people can start experimenting with implementing it. Um, we also plan to do the same for data frames. Um, I won't talk about that in this presentation, but data frames suffer from similar fragmentation and could benefit from uh, a similar standardization. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the scope of this Array API. Um, it has two main goals. Um, to enable writing code and packages that support multiple Array libraries. Uh, and also, uh, I think equally important, make it easy for end users to go from one library to the other without having to go through a whole new learning curve. Uh, you want users to you know, learn differences where they're essential, new functionality that a library offer, but not have to relearn all of the basics. So in scope for this array library are uh, the syntax and semantics, meaning, you know, what are things named? What do the signatures look like? What types do they accept? Um, and the behavior. So what results do we expect? Um, what's out of scope is execution semantics. So those can impose constraints, for example, like if you want to run uh, in parallel fashion or you want to use a JIT compiler, those things should all be possible with this API. Um, so that means we have to structure and you know, maybe leave out or you know, somehow make it possible that there are no fundamental problems with implementing the API, uh, but we're not going to say anything about how to implement it. Then, in terms of functionality, um, we talk about classing rules, about broadcasting, about indexing, and about Python operator support, um, but try and limit it to a core API. So if there are non-standard D types, like uh, complex or custom D types, or master array, or IO, or um, a non-Python API, uh, that's out of scope. Uh, two other important parts worth mentioning are data interchange. So how do I, as efficiently as possible, um, take data that's in one framework and transfer it to another framework? Um, and that has to come with device support as well. Um, something what's out of scope is exactly defining what happens uh, in corner cases where you, know, you give invalid keywords or you slice with something that's out of bounds. 
that's really detailed behavior that's hard to specify and that's likely going to differ between implementations. Um, so this picture shows a little more conceptually what we have in mind. So array libraries should be able to talk to each other. Right? So you typically have an array object and you have a set of functions. Um, the functions in array library one don't have to understand the array object of array library two. Right? You should take the object from array library two, turn it into one from array library one, and then all the functions in that library can use their native array type. However, in the, in the level above where you're consuming arrays, uh, there it should be easy to write code that works with multiple of these array libraries. Um, and the pattern here uh, shown for a softmax function um, where you pass in an array x, which can come from any library. Um, from that array itself, you can find its standard namespace. And then you know, you know, as long as you use only the functions in that namespace, this will work with any of these array libraries. So here's a brief overview of what the full API surface currently looks like. Uh, the single array object, um, which has six attributes, uh, a number of Dunder methods to support all the Python operators, and a couple of uh, special Dunder methods for versioning, getting a namespace, and a data interchange. Uh, then there are dtype literals, there is a device object, a couple of constants, and just over 100 functions. Um, so really this is what we think is close to the core functionality that every array library should provide. And now let's have a look at the published HTML document for the API standard. The standards document itself contains three sections. The first one, context, really tries to set the frame for uh, what the API is for, um, the use cases and assumptions that were made. And let's have a quick look at use cases. Uh, tells you the types of use cases we had in mind and some concrete use cases like how would I add GPU support to SciPy. And then the second section is the API specification itself. Um, where design topics really are the big picture topics that are often the hardest to get right. So we'll get back to those in more detail. And uh, something about how the API will evolve, uh, versioning, and then the API specification itself, which contains uh, details on functions and method signatures, uh, the array object itself, uh, all the methods that it has, indexing, data types, and type promotion rules, uh, broadcasting and then all the individual functions that will have signatures, details on parameters, um, some notes on numerical precision if needed, um, and what they return, including type information. And then finally, um, there's a section on methodology and usage that shows the data that was used to um, form the basis for constructing this API, as well as um, the test suite, which is still in progress, that you can run when you build a new implementation of this API. And same for benchmark suite. So the rest of this talk, I uh, will discuss some of the bigger pain points about semantics of array objects. Um, probably the biggest one has been mutability and copies views. So the concept of views is pretty fundamental for NumPy and other strided array implementations. Uh, views can be considered as an under the hood optimization until you mix it with a mutating operation on either the base array or on the view. Um, on the other hand, we have things like TensorFlow and JAX, which are based on an immutable data structure and Dask, which has very limited support for mutation because of its graph-based model. Um, so, kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, and we had to compromise. So we had to add the essential syntax, uh, leave out the rest, and warn users. Uh, that isn't completely satisfactory, um, but 
it's very hard to avoid. So what we decided to add was the in-place operators and support for item and slice assignment. Um, the most important thing we left out was the out equals keyword, um, which is very heavily used in NumPy and PyTorch. Um, and we have to tell users that in operations where they can have a view, which requires some teaching, um, that may result in implementation specific behavior if you mix it with a mutable operation. The next topic is casting rules. Um, they're relatively straightforward to align between the different libraries and they agree fairly well whenever the d-types are of the same kind. So all integer or all floating point. Uh, in Boolean we just have one kind, so that's easy. Um, whenever you start mixing integer and floating point, then uh, casting is very inconsistent between libraries. So here's a very simple example um, with an A range and a ones, um, where the A range should be uh, integer and the ones will make float 32. And when you just multiply those two arrays, you may get the float 32, which is uh, what most libraries will give you. Uh, NumPy will give you float 64 and um, TensorFlow will just raise. Um, this is something fairly fundamental, and even if you implement this API in a separate namespace, it's unlikely you're going to want to switch these casting rules between your main namespace and this new namespace. Uh, so therefore, we decided that this is one of the few areas where it will remain unspecified and will be explicitly implementation-defined behavior. So if you want your code to be portable, um, just do an explicit cast. Next topic is data dependent output shapes and d-types. Um, that is something that is problematic because of static memory allocation, um, which TensorFlow and JAX have, uh, because of graph-based scheduling from task or for JIT compilation. Uh, and the fundamental problem is the same, like if you can't predict what the output will be just based on the shapes, the d-types, and the other metadata of your input, um, then you can't do any of these things well. So on the right, I'm showing some examples uh, of where this happens. Um, so indexing is probably the most obvious way of getting this. Boolean indexing, um, which is used very heavily in NumPy and other strident array libraries, um, will give you a shape back that really depends on the values in the input and sometimes that can even happen with simple slicing if you slice with not like a constant value or like the shape of something else but something that depends on a value immediately the output array um, will have a shape that's dependent on the values of the other array that you used um, finally there's also a couple of functions uh, like unique um, that clearly depend on the data. Um, so these things are very important in many applications, so we decided to keep them. Um, however, we know this will be hard for some libraries, so we're going to clearly mark them as uh, being data dependent, so that you know they're likely to not work or not work well with a JS compiler, for example. Um, the second topic is value-based d-types. This is something that only NumPy does, where the output d-type can switch on the magnitude of your inputs. And here's a very simple example, where uh, if x is a float 32 array, um, then x plus 1 will give you float 32, and x plus 100,000 will give you a float 64 result back. Um, so this is something that not even the NumPy developers are happy with, so we decided to take that out of the standard, and that's going to require some changes in NumPy. Right now, the 
already. API standard is about 90% complete and we've opened it up for review, but there's still a couple of important topics to uh, add to, the, to what's published. The first one is data interchange. We decided to use the LPAC for that as the most suitable mechanism, but we still have to add a more intuitive Python level API to it. Uh, the next topic is device support. Um, we just have to finalize the syntax for it. Uh, then data dependent shape handling, that which I just discussed, uh, hasn't been completely integrated in the standards yet. And then there's a handful of regular functions that we know are still missing. Uh, some linear algebra ones, uh, result type, uh, which is needed for uh, casting, and mesh grid for ray creation. The next steps will be to complete the library independent test suite so you can take it and run it on your new implementation and see if it passes, yes or no. Uh, then we have to go on to the first prototype implementations because to smoke out some of the more subtle issues, um, you need people to try to implement this in your own library. Um, and then once we've got some experience with this, um, we need to get a sign off from at least one maintainer that represents each library um, to signal that like, this will actually work for it. We don't need completed implementations for every library, um, but we need to know that uh, people are on board with it. Uh, and finally, you know, we can finalize in 2021 like a first version of the standard, um, but we better need to better work out the process of how to add you know, optional extensions to it and how to evolve it in the future. Um, so, thank you. Uh, I hope this was interesting. Um, give some links here to where you can learn more or contact me. Um, yeah, thank you very much.